talks, the first talk in uh, uh, about the, the disaster management uh, and the process. There's a real bio-disaster, the, uh, uh, I think the structural map of the disaster uh, management for sustainability transition in quality so well. Okay, so my case is a case of communities. Uh, I'm here and I thought you'd be interested in uh, knowing what's going on in the Philippines. So what I'm going to talk about here has something to do with, uh, with disaster risk reduction management. And I will talk about the Philippines as, in terms of policy and program, I will talk about the Philippines as a nation at the national level. But I would like to use the north, uh, a particular region in northern Philippines as a case in point. So why? Let me let me start by saying uh, why the RRM or disaster risk reduction management because the Philippines use the RRM as a strategic case or strategic move towards sustainability transition. All talks about climate change now points to the RRM in the Philippines because the goal is towards sustainability transition. And, and there is a lot of work going on on the RRM in the Philippines. Northern Philippines is very... You could not read normally on the, on the newspapers, even on television, you won't hear this. So I'd like to introduce this region. Okay, so as far as the Philippines is concerned, I'd like to start by saying that there, eight, there are official commitments on the Philippines with regards to BRRM. It started all with climate change uh, official pronouncements, but at the same time, the most recent work has shifted towards BRRM. And the Philippines is getting a lot of support from United Nations, from other Southeast Asian countries, and the Philippines has a lot of or has uh, signified commitments to ASEAN and etc. and everything boils down to the RRM. Okay? So that's the reason why climate change now, climate change talks in the Philippines is always connected to disaster risk reduction management. And you know from possibly from television and newspapers that when you talk about the Philippines in relation to disasters, it's all about typhoons and flooding. You hear that a lot from news, but it's different in the mountains where, I, where I'm going to talk about. So this uh, DRR and climate change, you could read this stuff, and I'm not going into details about this. The, the, the trick here is that when you talk about this, these are all national and official commitments, but the work is all downloaded to the local government units. The coordination is done at the national level, but a lot of work has been downloaded to the local governments from the provincial air, the, from the province to the municipal, to the local government, in, uh, to the province, municipal, and then you have the barangays. So the workforce is practically all the local government units. Can you imagine that? There's a national policy, but the work is being done by local governments. And the idea there is that it has to be community-driven. Community-driven, but then the responsibilities will have to be under community leaders. Now in the Philippines, including the lowest level local government units, especially in the north, community leaders are also, uh, the politicians in there are coming from communities, from, from indigenous groups, from ro local leaders, in other words, you don't normally find somebody from Manila to be leading a, bar a barangay or a municipal level uh, area. It's led by local communities. They have their own leaders. Uh, because as I will um, discuss uh, later, local communities in the Philippines used to be very self-reliant communities. So um, the idea there, therefore, is to have uh, a national policy and everything will have to be localized. All the plans, all the policies will have to be translated at the national level depending on their needs and priorities. So we 
people who live in the Lord will have to address priorities in terms of not flooding, not the idea of flooding which you see in the in the lowland communities or on the t television and news. Our priority is mostly in the mountains. Our priority is to address landslides, and, you, and, and I'll talk about that in, in a while. So why landslides? Because if uh, okay, let me quickly talk about this. Okay, so this is the national law. And, and, and you will find this online. I will not talk about this um, specific, in, in specific terms. So it's where the Philippines were very good at having national laws. But it's different, of course, in terms of levels of implementation. I must say that. That when we implement, uh, there, we learn a lot and there are differences in the way we look at the law and when we implement the law, when programs are translated into actions. That's, that's a different case. So it's very comprehensive, it's all hazard, multi-sectoral, everything is there. It is beautifully crafted. No? Because we, we enjoy crafting laws. Our, I must say that our leaders are very good. You bring in all the minds. But at the same time, we also are lost when we try to implement a lot of things and maybe there's something wrong with the bureaucracy in which we are in, which is why we also have problematic situations as far as implementation of this is concerned. So take a look at this. The establishment of disaster risk reduction management office at various levels, this is this is the workforce of the national government. Okay? So it doesn't happen like you have a national agency and they implement this. No, everything will be done in here. And if you take a look at it, it's a good idea because then the participatory idea, the community vision should be there. Okay. And all whatever comes out from here will go into the national action plan. So that it's like community driven, it's like a bottom up uh, approach. So it's, it comes from the low, lowest level and it feeds into the national level. Okay, it was designed, it was strategically designed that way. That, is, that strategy, uh, I believe the national government has learned, uh, has learned to employ that because we have an existing local government code. Uh, that's, that, that really empowers communities or gives uh, a lot of decision-making stuff uh, done at the local level. Okay, so allow me to use the case of farming communities in the north. And let's talk about DRR and sustainability. So, many communities in northern Philippines are agricultural societies. And uh, some are farming communities that grow rice, you know? grow rice. You know, in the past, these are communities, in, and, and these are still existing until now. We grow rice, uh, in Ajmasa's rice is a staple food for all Asians, I, I believe. Um, we have our own rice produce, and we used to have a lot of communities who are self-reliant, but it is no longer the case now. Uh, a lot of popu the population has grown, and we are, and you know that the Philippines is importing rice from Thailand. Okay, that's at the national level. But for communities like this, the rice that is produced here is not enough, so we buy rice that is produced from the other areas in the Philippines. Okay. Now the other thing I want to talk about is that this. So these are mountains that are transform into farming communities. And if you look at this, this used to be like, how do you call that? These are, these are forests, but these are man-made forests. So, uh, when people inhabit this area and create a livelihood, the next, the part of the work that they do is to create their own man-made forests because we used to be using uh, wood as firewood. You know, we, we, 
use firewood to cook food before. But that's no longer the case. We have shifted a lot to other cooking um, materials. So what, why am I telling this? Because when we talk about DRR and management in the Philippines, ancestral domain is a key issue. The idea of communities owning this particular area because they have they have worked on this for a long period of time is very, very crucial in any policy and program. So for instance, the government wants to accelerate all tree planting activities. Let's do all the national breeding program. When the Philippines called on that, a lot of communities complained that no, the government already has declared that these are national properties, no, we would like to maintain our autonomy that we own the forest that we planted because this is man-made forest and this is private agricultural property by plants or lineage groups. So that's, that's a crucial aspect. Now, when, when barangays have to decide, the local government units have to decide on this, they have to, they have to demonstrate that these are things that people do but we have to stay with them and the ownership of this property will have to stay with communities. Okay. Now things are shifting. Other communities in the Philippines are into gardening, commercial, vegetable gardening that now address commercial production of vegetables. And many of these vegetables are sold to the national market. So a lot of Philippine markets are actually buying uh, these vegetables that are grown in um, in northern Philippines, which is why the national government is very interested in the north because we are the suppliers of very good vegetables throughout the country. Okay. We learn a lot from the Japanese in terms of techniques in growing uh, vegetables. Um, uh, there are, of course, a lot of new techniques that have, we have adapted from development programs that includes uh, other Asian countries, um, uh, including Korea and Taiwan. It's very interesting. I recently learned of a Taiwan, a variety of sweet potato named Taiwan. And I said, <laughs> wow. A sweet potato and the name of that variety is Taiwan. And I said, oh, this possibly is introduced by a Taiwanese? I don't know, I didn't ask about the history, I'm sorry about that. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so we're into commercial farming now. And the government is worried about this because of the high inputs of fertilizers and pesticides. Um, and this really feeds into a lot of problems in terms of carbon emission as well. Okay, so just to, just to give you an idea that the photograph, this is a 1900s photograph. We used to have, this, these are the harvest from sweet potatoes that we have in northern Philippines. And they could harvest us as much as this. And this, this uh, sweet potato farming is now competing with, our, with other commercial products, unfortunately. Um, we used to have very good varieties which are very resilient and resistant to pest, resistant to drought. But we, uh, the, the availability of all these varieties are now uh, problematic. Uh, we have one university who's taking care of this, but they're having a problem in terms of the seed bank and the continuity of all these local varieties. Okay, so you have this on your kids, so I'm not going to read this one by one. But I just want to show that as far as, yeah, by the way, the, I'm, the case in point here that I'm talking about is Benguet communities. I, I live in a city in the north called Baguio City, Baguio City. And this city uh, is part of the Benguet province. And as far as agricultural concerns are, uh, I mentioned earlier about the increasing population um, in this area and as far as local and indigenous communities are, the government and a lot of NGOs, uh, civil society groups, are looking into this problem that communities will have to be aware of 
So in, in other words, well, in general in the Philippines, when you talk about climate change, it's for them, it's not a serious thing. Unlike perhaps other areas in Asia, when you talk about climate change, there is perhaps 90% or 100% acceptance that climate change exists and it's a problematic situation. In the Philippines, when you talk about climate change, to even professors in the Philippines find it very difficult to say that, yeah, this is caused by climate change. Uh, a few of us would venture into the study of climate change. I have a, a friend, a group of friends, physics professors who would say, no, climate change happens in a long period of time. What we're seeing now is not climate change. So there are still you know, com competing views about what's going on. So the strategy now is to look into DRRM, the DRR stuff, so that the locals will have to take this seriously. Okay? And so that's our entry point as academics who want to help communities build resilience. Because to them, it has now become like a direction that the local government is there, we, they will take care of us. Once the structure is there, communities who venture into all this vegetable production would think that there's a big role of the local government and all problems and disasters will have to be taken care of by the government. So a lot of so universities now and other agencies, including um, non-government agencies, are working towards I'm sorry, are working towards all these innovations. So much trainings have been done already. A lot of trainings have been done. There have been there's a gradual shift. It's very slow, I must say. It's very, very slow, but we're working on this gradual shift to organic production. And in fact, in the north and even in Manila, there's a very, very high demand for organic products. And that's vegetable, the raw vegetables. But farmers find it very difficult because they, they have now imbibed the use of commercial fertilizers. So we're shifting to that, but still it's very slow. So a lot of institutions are now working uh, on this and, and try to move beyond these immediate responses that, that a lot of communities have done. Um, what we're trying to see is to work on traditional livelihoods that have changed over time. We're not talking about traditional livelihoods that could have been done in there, but who, that have changed over the period of time. So, uh, if you look in, if you look at this, these are things that are ongoing, and we're still experimenting on other stuff. Okay, the most problematic stuff in the Philippines, in the north, has something to do with landslides. And when you talk landslides, it's a very serious stuff. You can imagine all national highways are closed so that communities you know, will have to stay in put, nobody moves. Because all the national roads are closed with landslides like this. And when landslide happens, it comes with mud because it's rain-induced. And so all the distractions are there. And what the Philippines is doing is to to address this first at, at the same time. And this seems to be the priority in the north, to address landslides and problems with agricultural productivity, which I discussed earlier. So it's a serious stuff because it can bury a whole community. It can bury a whole community. And this happens a lot in many mining communities in the north because we have mining areas. And so uh, the, the, the area has really been disturbed, okay? Uh, and these are things you won't see on television or even in the news because these are things that, you know, it may seem like not a priority of the media, but if you look at local news, you would really see the gravity of landslides in the Philippines. So, and this is my last slide. I tried to put it at 10 slides because I know I'm going to speak only in 20 minutes. So, the current idea is to link DRR to climate, uh, to climate change, and the DRR is actually the idea to make this like an adaptation measure 
um, at the current and short term, and then it is towards climate change adaptation, which comes at a longer, uh, at a long, long term, um, um, long term strategy. So the idea is to start address the immediate problem first, and that's disaster risk reduction, before you can really plan well on climate change adaptation on a long term basis. So it's very, it's it's a it's an important strategy of the Philippine government. And we're trying to see this at the local level that fits well to how we view and how we act on things. Remember that many local communities in the Philippines, especially indigenous communities, have very strong connections and ownership of their lands, which is why when they when they, they work on their lands and they deal and the, and, the, and the effort that they have on in that particular area is very important which is why if there is a case where the government, the national government, imposes into them, they will not listen, communities won't listen, communities will have to do their own and work as far as that could uh, address immediate problems they have. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Leon, give us the, the you know, very structured, uh, uh, methods of the, uh, uh, disaster management and uh, the carbon reduction. We know just uh, this month uh, we, uh, there was also a severe flooding occurring in Japan and brought many people's life. And I remember in 2014 also a flooding occurred in Seoul, in Jiangnan, in Gangnan area, very rich area also. Also, uh, the journalists have some problems. Uh, of course, in Taiwan, we have also uh, the severe lender side of problems uh, that uh, uh, possibly is related to uh, extreme climate change. So, uh, so we have to come on, actually, the come on yeah, problems. That, uh, what uh, are the, you know, the Policy of the current governments, yeah, in Philippines, in Taiwan, in South Korea, in, in Japan, yeah, I think it's uh, actually it, uh, we try to develop, the, you know, the imagination. What is the common characteristics of the risk governments or carbon reduction in this region? And the Taiwan, the new uh, government is now engaged in the new. Uh, Southbound mm -hmm. policies, uh, and uh, we also concert uh, many uh, countries in uh, South Asia also have a very severe yeah, problem or disaster problem. So maybe we can yeah, uh, contribute more but, yeah, yeah, for this yeah, common problem. So we open to the floor. Uh, any question to uh, the speaker? Uh, I'm Lee from uh, National Power University. Uh, thanks for your speech. Uh, uh, I, I have a question. Um, you, you mentioned uh, that we are impre impressive on what uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, they are obvious at uh, every level. Uh, as to uh, capacity building, uh, could you talk about more uh, policy uh, instruments or uh, networks, mechanisms for us? Thank you. Here again, this is Lee from National Central University. Uh, I know that in the Philippines that the DRR, Disaster Risk Reduction, has been placed very high on your government agenda. But I'm more curious on the institutional arrangement or dimensions. You know, like who is the lead agency? Or if not, would that be you know, like a multilateral or the intergovernmental uh, task force? And how is being uh, managed? Thank you. Following this uh, question, actually we know that uh, Taiwan and the Philippines have, have, have uh, organized the, the task force called uh, Center for uh, Climate Change and Society. 
in APEC. Yeah, so I don't know whether you know what is the progress that the you know, international chairmans are dealing with the climate change. This is important for breaking up in Taiwan. And we know that South Korea has their own uh, climate change center in APEC. Yeah, Japan also had. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Capacity building. We're talking capacity building in the local government units at different levels. Uh, the first assessment on DRRM implementation in the Philippines said that it was a wrong move because all the LGUs were not prepared and they didn't have the capacity to deliver the work. That's the first assessment in 2015. Our DRRM uh, program started in, to, the, the law started in, the law was signed in 2010. And the implementation started from there. Five years after, they knew very well that all local governments were not prepared and they didn't have the capacity to deliver the work. Because it has, start, it has to start with policy, program, and sourcing of funds to implement all the programs. So that's, that's the kind of work. But little did they know that a lot of outside training institutes, including the local government academy of the Philippines, have been training all the government units. So the idea was really to implement the law with the safeguard of bringing a lot of training programs for all LGUs. Now, what's the current station now? What's the current condition now? Uh, I would say that perhaps 30% of LGUs have now increased a lot their capacity to handle the DRRM. But many LGUs, because of the change of terms of mayors, for instance, they change, then you have to train another set. So that, that part, because the structure says that at the local government unit, the mayor is the head. And so if the mayor change, then you have to train another one. <laughs> but there is a permanent staff in there who holds a permanent post. There's a permanent staff who holds a permanent position as a DRRM officer at the provincial, the municipal, and barangay level. Okay, so they have that. But I must say that still in terms of capacity, a lot of things are changing in terms of DRR talks, and our government officials in those levels are still our progress in terms of capacity and training is a bit slow. But we are very hopeful that these trainings can help or progress a bit. But a lot of training needs needs to be done, especially that if you use the government bureaucracy to implement disaster preparedness, it really takes a lot of academic tra training to be able to deliver this. It's not a training that you get in two months, five months, even a week, and then you deliver a DRRM program. It's so unfair to the, DM, to the DRRM officer to do that, uh, especially that it's, uh, the, the position they are giving as a permanent one does not really have a very high salary scale. So even if there is an engineer or a disaster expert in there, the local governments cannot hire right away because the position is not really a high paid salary position. So those are some of our problematics, but we're trying to address these two trainings. Um, institutional arrangement. Yes, it is multi-level, it's intergovernmental. Uh, there are, the lead agency is the uh, Office of Civil Defense, Office of Civil Defense in the Philippines. The other agencies would have their specific roles. So it's, it's all defined in our uh, national plan. All these shared responsibilities, the specific responsibilities of agencies who are involved in here is defined. Now, again, that's in law. That's in our plan. Uh, you know that when we implement things, there are still 
bottlenecks that have to be addressed, and especially that the idea of DRRM is a uh, is an added. I, I would like to uh, emphasize the term added. It's an added responsibility of these offices. No, it's an added responsibility, and it's not something that you add more people to handle the situation. It's an added work, and so some would work on it on the side, unfortunately. Um, the Center for Climate Change in APEC, um, the national government deals with this at the uh, national scale, uh, not really preview on what's the de development in here, but I know that the Philippines is very active as well in any international negotiations, any memberships to climate change and DRR talks. Um, we have specific offices that work on that. Um, my monitoring is really much more at the lower levels of government implementation. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a member from NGO um, Environmental. Uh, in 2013, uh, Haiyan Typhoon is a very severe, strong Typhoon uh, attack the uh, Philippines, uh, most areas, I think so. And what do you learn about from the uh, Typhoon? especially on the uh, community or the local government. When there's typhoon in the Philippines, depending on where you are, you either fear flood or landslides. Those are the two most important part, and that's where all the our, our efforts are. So where when you are at the lowland areas like Manila, Cebu. You always fear flood. Flood can strike any time. No? When you're in the mountain areas like the north, it's always landslide that you fear. It's 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 really a deadly thing, and people are now realizing this. I think that awareness of floods and landslide is now a serious thing, and that's where we connect to say that you know this is climate change because it. When we talk about climate change before, uh, like five or six years ago, people are like, what is happening? This, that's just in, in, in movies. In the, in this climate change and all these adversities are just in movies. Okay? Um, so, but when, re, when there is a repetitive occurrence of floods and landslides, the, the consciousness of people are now into this. But the immediate response would have to do with how communities, small groups, try to help each other and address, you know, uh, last slides like this. The first thing, of course, is to save lives of people who are affected. So we go into the immediate recovery, for instance. Last slides are there. We have to check on people who might have been caught or have been buried in the last slides. No? There have been cases of people along the passing through national highways and being buried in those highways. There are cases where communities like this affected with mudslides, and these are types of preparedness that we try to address at the at the provincial and municipal level. Um, there are, I must say, that there were cases of resistance from communities. No? They don't want to move from that area. They don't want to relocate. They don't want to use evacuation centers. They don't want to do that. Only a few communities would like to address that. They would rather stay with relatives elsewhere instead of using the evacuation center. So those are the cultural and social stuff that we have to consider when we implement BRRM strategies. At first, 
instance, the government has been questioning some regions why the evacuation centers are not working. Because part of the law, the law requires that each municipality should have an evacuation center. And some municipalities have to follow that. But when it's disaster time, people won't use it. They would rather go to their relatives, stay in their relations, you know. They go to their relations, they go to their relatives, they go to their friends if you go, instead of going to the evacuation centers. But in Manila, the case is different. In the central region of the Philippines, evacuation centers are not even enough. Evacuation centers are being used heavily by the central government, which is different in the north in mountain communities. So that, that's an important case in point.